water to many is something that's taken for granted. But as I look at water, we have to see that the planet is made up of 71% water. So there is quite a bit there. But when we take it so much for granted that when we can turn a tap on and get all the water we want, we don't see the significance of it. But when I look at it in a spiritual mindset, that's something that then transforms. We see it in a different way because of the fact that it symbolizes so many different things. I look at water in the scriptures and I can see where the significance of, of uh, where it tells me of the spirit of God. It tells me of the, that cleansing that takes place, that sanctification. So when I see that in this, it's something to, to believers that means something that's vital. It's something in our life that we can look at and realize the importance of. So many times this water leads us right to the act of baptism. When I look at baptism, it's something that, that, that strikes a real chord because many today don't see the significance of baptism, but yet there is such great significance into it if we see the reality and the history of it. So stay tuned and we're going to look into this very subject. Baptism is something that we realize is, is comparing to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We know that from the Word. We know that from the many messages that's been preached about it. But sadly, so many times it's become a, a thing of just going through the motions. We come, but we come to Christ, and right away they tell you you've got to be baptized. But that's all they say. They're, they're just looking at command and don't realize the significance of that command. So I want to take the time here and view that and see the importance of it. Because when we look at baptism, it's more than just an act of obedience. Um, there's strong implications of warfare that goes with baptism. And I think Peter brings this out in a great way. And if we can understand one of the hardest verses in Scripture, really, the most confusing maybe, we can see a reality to that that, that clears up quite a bit when it comes to baptism. So I want to look at the book of 1 Peter in chapter 3. Because here Peter gives us some, to some would say, a strange set of scriptures. But, but, at the re, but the reality of it is that they're not if we really dig into the word. So let's start in 1 Peter 3.18. It says, For Christ hath once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, putting, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, for which also he, hath, he went and preached unto the spirits in prison which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein a few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure, whereunto each, even baptism, doth also now save us, not that the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. There's a lot to the scripture um, when we begin to really look into it because it really goes back into Genesis. It goes all the way to back to Genesis 6 where we see the, the sons of God mating with the, uh, the women of the earth. But what we realize in this is they face judgment for that day. Now there's a lot of controversy whether those were actual men or angels. Well, I believe they were angels, and it can be backed up through Scripture. So when I look at this and I begin to see it, what takes place is Jesus now through Peter is telling us the importance of that event and how that event transforms into what we have through baptism. So when I look at that and can realize it in that way, this begins to, to open things up in my mind and in my thinking that gives me the knowledge and understanding of what baptism is because what Peter did here was go through a process of promoting uh, the thought of going back into that day and using it as a comparison of what Jesus did during the, the time that he was in that grave to the time that Peter seen him in the resurrection. So through this it's, in, it's encouraging and it's also exciting to see how they use the pre-flood days to bring this into our day and it makes it so relevant. So as we look at this, what we see basically is a foreshadow taking place then of what was to come. Because when you break this down and you begin to see it, this time that God sees in the days of Noah was basically a time of waiting, a time of patience. So when Noah built that ark, he waited, or I should say God waited for that whole process to take place. 
being in the process of that, he knew that there would only be eight that would come through that water and, and find salvation at the end of it. So as I see that, it gives me a, a hope by what takes place in my own life and what the scriptures teach. So as I see this, I see that that water basically was a judgment. It was, it was something that, that took away the old and brought in the new. And, and then when I look at that, I see an importance because when I come to Christ, I came to a place where I was baptized and that baptism created something within us. And, and I'm going to prove this and show this to us here in a second. But we have to realize that these judgments of the flood was an act of spiritual warfare. Because now what we've seen was um, chaos being taken away. God was eliminating the evil at that time, and he was starting afresh. So as the, you look at that and we begin to open our thoughts to this, that moment was an act of spiritual warfare that we're seeing now that's taking place during the act of baptism. And this is the way that, that Peter's leading us. He, he's de, uh, taking us into that, um, into that realm of thought. We have to figure where this starts and, and see within this because I think the key to this is in verse 21 because it tells us here that it's a figure, an anti-type. So know what he says here in, in this. And when we go back to verse 21, he says this, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when I look at that and I begin to, begin to see these thoughts, there's a couple things that stand out here. Because he uses that word figure. We have to really dig into that to really understand what's taking place here. Because Peter now was, was decisively telling us that this whole scene right here was a figure or uh, what's called an antitype. Now an antitype is a person or a thing that represents the opposite of someone or something else. Something that is represented by a symbol. So this is what we're taking place here. It's, it's bringing that figure to light that's showing me this is a type that's taking place. Now, if you do a search of that word figure in, in, the, in the Bible, it, there's only used twice. When that Greek word, it, it comes to two places here and then also in Hebrews 9.24. Hebrews 9.24 kind of gives us an insight to this and brings it out in a little more clear way. He says this in, in, in uh, 9.24. For Christ does not enter into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true. So right there, he's telling us that this is a type, an anti-type of what's being talked about. But into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. The holy places in the Old Testament was where basically man met God. They came to that place knowing that in there, that is where God is going to meet with man. Now, when we see that in the Old Testament, what the writer of Hebrews is telling us is that that was a figure, uh, an anti-type, a figure of what was to come. It was a type, a shadow. So when I look at this and I begin to look at this in a hard way, I see that this is speaking of what Jesus is going to do in the future. Jesus is what we see now is, is that holy place. He was figured in, a, in the, on the holy places in the Old Testament as an anti-type. And in the New Testament as a reality. So to me, when I look at this, it's something that comes out in a great way to tell me the power and the significance and the, the beauty of Christ. It tells me his sovereignty and, and the place he holds in, in all of eternity. So as we view this and we see this, uh, this whole process that Peter's bringing out, we realize that the flood was an important view of what baptism represented. It's not a washing away, Peter says, of the filth. What that tells us is that it is not through salvation. We do not get baptized and saved through baptism. We get saved through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other way into the Father except by the Son. So baptism then becomes a figure of what is truly a spiritual warfare act. That's the key to this thing. It's, it's not just a, an act that we go through. It's just simple obedience. It is obedience, but it goes far beyond that because it's now making something of, of power. As we begin to break this down, the key I think we find in, as I said, in verse 21, but the answer of a good conscience is toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When we read this verse, there's two words that stand out here that we really have to grab a hold of. And if we can understand these two words, it begins to place... Um, a great emphasis on the importance of baptism. 
and how far reaching it really does. So let's break these down. The first word we see is answer. When we look at that word answer, it's referring that through baptism, we are making a vow. We're making a vow to stand. It's, a, it's basically a pledge that I saying by this act, I am now pledging my allegiance to Jesus Christ. You know, there's many countries in, um, around the world that when they do baptisms now, they have that renunciation. They make that vow yet that they stand for Christ and none other. Well, we, they, they, they walk away from the world and, and it's made through this vow. The second word we see is this, it's conscience. Now, this is a strange word because we basically look at it as conscious, as, as something in our mind is where we get regrets and, and that conscience that weighs on us that, that we have to act upon. But as you study this word out, it goes far beyond that. Uh, William Arndt, in his book, A Greek-English Lexicon of the New Testament and Other Early Christian Literature, states that the word refers to an attitude or a decision that reflects one's loyalty. And, and to me, that's an important part. Um, so as I go to baptism, it's not something that I do and just count it, <coughs> excuse me, count it done. It's something that I take as a vow that I hold to that vow, no different than somebody that makes a pledge like a doctor that says he's going to do this as part of his pledge for life, that he's going to heal the sick, that he's going to never refuse to work on somebody, no matter who they are. They're going to take that oath. And when I take the oath to follow Christ, it's no different. I'm making a pledge to stand before him and vow that no matter what comes him into my life, I'm going to reflect his loyalty because this is a matter of warfare. And when I go down into that water and I come out of it because symbolizing the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, I know that I'm relating to him in such a way that my pledge, no matter what comes into my life, I'm going to be able to stand and I'm going to go forward in that battle. Um, he's equipped us. He's given us everything we need. So what does all this mean? Uh, how far can we take this? I believe Peter here is referring to the act of baptism as a pro a public proclamation. Uh, it, it is a public proclamation of loyalty. It's that oath that I stand by. We're saying that we are going to serve Jesus no matter what comes, no matter who's in control, no matter how far that goes. Uh, many in the Old Testament and throughout the New, we see live their life as a martyr. They laid their life down because when they took that oath, they were going to stand no matter what. And I truly believe that we come in and do a day that we are going to have to make that stand. And if I don't have this oath, if I don't take it sincerely, then I will be weak in my pledge, and I will not stand. I, I will falter. So baptism in the early days of the church, uh, after Pentecost, when they began to baptize people, that's just what this was. It was an oath that they were going to renounce Satan and all his parts, all his angels, all his reasoning, everything had to go. And when they went in and renounced that, they were making a pledge to the world. And all that seen that understood what was taking place. You know, when we go back to the early church fathers, and I believe that that's where this has to go, we have to realize that this is something that's just not new teaching. We have to understand that this is something that was taught from the early church, and that's what we have to grab a hold of. We've had so much tradition come into the, uh, to the church that we've lost sight of what things are truly to mean. So we go back and we look at the early church days and find out how they looked at things and how they um, operated with that in their own lives. And we see this in, in, by one writer by the name of Tertullian. Tertullian lived between 155 and 220 A.D. So we have a good indication of what the early church believed even at that time. But Tertullian said this, when we are going to enter the water, but for a little before, in the presence of the congregation and under the hand of the president, we solemnly confess that we will disown the devil and his pomp and his angels. What we see here is a total renunciation of evil. We're claiming to the public, to the world, to all them before us, we're making that pledge that I will serve Christ. Now, will we falter? Well, of course we will. But we also know that that pledge is going to hold us true. It's going to hold us to where the Holy Spirit can convict us in such a way that by the oath that I made, he will bring that to my thinking and he will bring that to a place where I, I'm brought back. And that's what's key. If, if we don't come back, then we're eventually going to walk away from that oath and think that it meant nothing to us. And that's where we begin to get in trouble. 
if this was the only place that we've seen this, we could look at it and say, eh, it might not be the, 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 the real way they looked at it. But when we look at it from another area, we see the Armenians followed the same way. They stated theirs this way. We renounce thee, Satan, and all thy deceitfulness, and thy wiles, and thy service, and thy paths, and thy angels. Baptism, then, was and still is a, a, an act of spiritual warfare. It's an act of spiritual warfare that we're proclaiming uh, that Christ is our Lord and King, that we are in his army, that we are a follower of him, and we will move and act where he moves and acts. So through that, we realize that, that I, it's up to me to make that oath secure. This is when we have a purpose to our Christian walk. I believe that when we come so many times with such an easy believism day that we live in, that when somebody says they get saved and they just do a little act of obedience going under the water and they call it a day, they, they think that they're good. But yet at the same time, how easy it is to fall if we don't have that oath secure. If I'm just doing it by a thought or an idea or something somebody wants me to do, then that oath will mean nothing. But if I truly mean that oath when I go down into that water and come back up and know that Christ is my Lord and Savior, and now I pledge allegiance to him in all areas of my life, no matter what, then it makes a difference. Then we will be able to stand. And then we will be that soldier in the army that Christ needs so badly. And today we need that more than ever. Because every day the enemy is taking a hold of this world. And if we don't have the oath to stand, and we don't have the, the, the honor of that pledge to hold us true, then it's going to be easy to walk away. It's sad that when, when all of this started to change, I, I, I looked this up and tried to figure out where all this ended. But when you get into the 18th century, the church then stopped renunciating this, this vow. They, they stopped renunciating the devil and all his works. It was just a, a pledge that you'd serve Jesus. But we have to understand that, that it has to go beyond that. It's got to go further. We have to renunciate and, and, and allow Christ that, that, the supremacy of our life. And that's what the oath means. And today, baptism, and I hate to say it, has just become a formality. And, and it's something that, that we put in our a little feather in our hat and say that, that we accomplished something. But we have to go deeper than that. Baptism does not save us. It does not save us. But it secures us with what takes place. It secures in what I've acknowledged as Christ being the sovereign in my life. So this means this. It means that by the act of baptism, I make a solemn oath to the world, securing an attitude of steadfastness to the decision that I have made to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I hope that you've made that, that vow, that pledge. If not, I plead for you to do it. Because if, if the days come that, that we truly are in the, the great battles, we will need that. But yet in our everyday life, we need that same thing. We have to realize that Christ is our hope. He is the way that we have life. He is the way that we have victory. And there is no other way than that. We can, we can try to candy coat it in any way we want. But if we're going to stand for Christ, if we're going to fight the good fight, then we need to stand strong. We need to take that vow and allow that vow to be the guide in our life. Know that, that when I go to prayer each day, that I'm going knowing that, that Christ is my King, He's my Lord, and that I can go to Him for my orders, I can go to Him for my help, I can go to Him for, for uh, security, peace, whatever it might be, because He's promised us all these things. But it's a matter of me of taking my vow and allowing that to guide me. I hope that's where you're at, and I pray that's where you'll be. So until the next time, stay in the Word.